and welcome to Momento Malum. And this time we're having another interview with Paul Stuttholm. Hi, Brandon. Good Hello. to meet you. Good to meet you as well. So let's begin the questions. Do you want to introduce yourself first? Okay. Yeah, sure. I'm, um, I, I'm not sure how many of your uh, viewers will know the area where I'm based, but I'm based in Cobham in Surrey in England in the UK um, I've I've been working I guess on on gardens and plants since I was 16 15 years old um, I've been running my own landscape company for that long um, I also set up another business back in 2007 I took on um, a derelict walled kitchen garden in Cobham um, about a four or five acre site which I um restored kind of, well not back to a kitchen garden because that would be not it, it didn't interest me that much to do that and also it'd be a bit pointless because people don't use them anymore but i wanted to restore the features of the kitchen garden but bring it into a, into the modern day and make it more relevant for people for today to use so it was it created a space for people to come and meet relax and get some good medicine which is why hence the name the medicine garden which we called it um so that was a a 12 year journey for me um finished i i actually last august sold the assigned the lease to someone else basically the it, it was um with covid and various other financial um pressures um what was essentially a lifestyle business became a bit too stressy to be honest so i i i I exited that and then went back to full-time garden design and landscape work, which is what I'm doing, in fact, today as we speak almost. So, But all kitchen garden, can you give me a little bit of a history of that garden, of what it was like before, what it was like in the ancient past, and what it was like during your time running it? Sure. So um, kitchen gardens were but basically in the uk and in most of europe certainly and, and further afield as well but predominantly in europe um back in the this one dated back to around about 1850 um so around about the 18 well the seven 1800 1900s any large house would have built a kitchen garden um as part of their their landscape there so they'd have formal gardens and then they'd have this kitchen garden which would always be walled um, to give firstly to give some protection from frost and to create a microclimate environment but also to keep out the peasants if you like <laughs> we're literally the peasants um from stealing the crops and 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 that essentially was that was basically their supermarket if you like so before the days you could i mean now we just go to the supermarket the the, the grocers whatever and grab our bits if we need it's easy um but then you had to grow everything or else you didn't basically have anything and, and they used to they were quite a status symbol as well at the time some of them now the one the one i had in in the scheme of kitchen gardens was a pretty sophisticated setup it had a, it had a large open space of two acres where they would have grown um fruit um soft fruit potatoes sort of brassicas that kind of the open open field crops if you like um and then behind a very large wall well actually in front sorry in front of the wall on the wall what there was the an enormous vine house which sadly had disintegrated before i got there but the wall was still there um which would have been purely for grapevines um i mean a huge amount of money for for when you you know in for, for what you're you could for someone to build that now would just be prohibitive really unless they're mega rich um and then behind that wall are the what they call the back sheds, which are potting sheds and more sort of service areas. So there'd be one of them was a, and these were pretty extensive at this place. So um, they, they're about 100 meters long, um, actually about 150 because they went down the side as well. And they encompass that one of them was a root house where they would have um, done root cuttings. There was a the potting shed for potting on stock, which had a well in it as well. Um, then um, a tool room which was where the gardeners would keep their equipment and um warm up in the winter there's open fire in that one um then there was a seed room which is where they would keep the seeds that they'd harvested 
to keep them for the next year's crops. Um, then then a, a boffy, which is now the so these gardens to become a head gardener was quite a prestigious job in those days. It took a lot of time and learning and you would get what were called under gardeners, traveling gardeners that would go to lots of different kitchen gardens around the country and do their apprenticeship. If you like do a year or two at each one, they'd live in what's called the boffy, which you've probably heard of boffies. It's, um, and it was a small room where it would have been bunked out and there'd be six or seven guys in there, um, doing their, learning their their trade if you like then there's a big a, a bigger house which is where the head which is where i used to live actually which is um was the head gardener's cottage which would be lived in by the head gardener who would run the whole operation um and and his family and usually a couple of other servants from the main mansion in there as well so um and then you had a cart shed where he'd keep the horses because they'd had a, they'd have a couple of ponies there for work in the ground um and then uh um i think that was probably a state and lots oh and then a hot house so sorry that yeah which we turned into um a restaurant and later on a, a cocktail bar um we, that was um a standalone three quarter span building it's called so um which would have been used for peaches nectarines the more tropical plants and those were the really prestigious things to put on the table for the man. You know, they'd impress their friends with, the, you know, the exotic fruits they'd grown. And all, all these things, would because they would have been recently brought into the country via plant hunters all around the world doing, collecting plants. And um, so it's quite, it, it was a very prestigious thing to have. And, and it, you know, the nice of your kitchen garden was the, the belly you looked with, your, you know, in, in, in terms of status so they're quite fascinating places really well designed to catch the warmth the walls heat up during the day and, and act like a storage heater so then they put at night time when it's frosty then you can back out the walls again from the red bricks so all the aspects are right for all the plants and everything so it's really well very well designed hot water pipes and boiler rooms as well great big boilers that would pump hot water all the way around all the different buildings and glass houses to keep them warm so it, a pretty pretty impressive bit of engineering considering it was 150 200 years ago yes it is um, that's pretty darn impressive yeah they're I've fascinating got, places so uh where did you keep the steam where did you change in terms of the re restoration of that garden so um the previous tenants who had it were there for probably 40 years luckily they all they did really was fill it up with stuff that all the rooms were just filled up with junk so it was fairly well preserved in that in you know they hadn't ripped it apart and changed it around so i wanted to keep that the history element because it's fascinating and it, it really gives life to the place and the meaning behind it so i i kept as much of the original features but tidied it up a bit so that it was usable for and and so that it would be a viable business as well so that we could actually keep it um so mostly it was um just cleaning up the rooms we did put we put electric water plumbing into each unit into all the different back sheds and then those were rented out to local small businesses so so we had like a little hub of independent businesses there um, like florists, um, curtain makers, um, artists, uh, uh, jewellery artists and things like that. Um, the main garden, I start, I mean, I was very much prohibited by my, my, my fine, you know, I'm not a wealthy person. I did this all off. It was just a long process using resources I had with my landscape work um, and my own skills and and the guys that worked for me. If we had some time, we'd go in there and you know we'd put a few weeks aside and blitz it for a bit and then go back to work and do earn some money and then go back again and do some more. So we to start with the main garden, I, I literally just cleared it and turfed it. Um, it took four years just to clear the site and tidy it up before we could let any of the public in and start renting out anything um so we i seeded it sorry cleared it seeded it and then started cutting beds into it and then we created a circular 
bed that ran all the correct so if you look at it on google maps which you can see if you if you google the medicine garden cobham you'll see it on there you'll get an aerial view and you'll see a circular bed with eight trees in the circle each one of those trees we put in a compass point so that you've got the a physical compass in the garden as well and you, which you can walk around um, and each different tree had a different intention behind it as well so it, that was our our medicine wheel so um, based on sort of ancient North American medicine wheel philosophy so the idea being people could go to to one of the areas there'd be a plaque there explaining what it is like an, an area for inspiration one for rhythm one for different elements in your life that to 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 balance up and get a more balanced life and better well-being so um that that was a sort of part of the design around that garden then those beds were planted with um a mixture of sort of quite natural wild looking flowers herbaceous plants grasses um a tree in each position um and then the rest of it kept kept as lawn just really simple so it's a really nice open space we used to use it we needed the space for events as well we did a lot of events there um and as soon as you walk in it just holds you basically the, the simplicity of it and the space people just found it and, and the fact that it's all walled in and you've got a circle you walk into you instantly feel calmer and more relaxed as soon as you walk in so that was the philosophy behind the garden design if you like and then the rest of it we we refurb the buildings made them watertight etc and like i say modernized them a little bit but kept all the original elements in there kept some of the water pipes the old stable hay lofts and things like that fine uh on to the next question you've been in the landscape business for what's for what seems to be a long time considering yeah. your look <laughs> uh oh. That's very kind of you. <laughs> Keeps you young being outdoors. So uh, I'm wondering, what are the most popular plants found that that your clientele want to look for? What are what are the most popular plants that your clientele want? Okay, so interesting because I've been yeah I've been twenty what am I I'm forty eight now so so fifth yeah 30 years pretty much of land of working with plants on pub, uh, predominantly private um projects for clients um and you know they go there is plants do they go through a bit like fashion they go do go through phases of popularity and, and things probably a sort of five-year phase i reckon um and at the moment it's um probably the last few years it's very much People were after they want hydrangeas. Generally, mostly the white ones, so hydrangea Annabelle or the paniculatas with the more upright conical flowers. Um, and lavender, everyone loves lavender. You can't you can't you can't go wrong if you put lavender in someone's garden, basically. Generally they love it. So lavender and hydrangeas is probably the two top plants, I'd say. Um and then you've got gra ornamental grass is very popular. People quite like that wild, a bit like I did at the medicine garden. They're quite a, sort of wild style planting, but it isn't actually wild. It's a bit easier to look after. So um, hydrangeas, echinacea as well. That's very popular. Um, Napita I use quite a lot. The um, catmint with the blue flower. So that it's a good, great, easy grower that fills a big space very quickly and easily and cheaply. So it's a good, good filling. But they're probably, and Japanese maples are always popular, always have been. Um, the more architectural plants, I guess. And then you've got on the trees, hornbeams are popular, pre predominantly for like the pleached ones for screening. Um, yeah, probably. And and then you've got hedge and things like fatinia. So people are moving away from privet, laurel, and that kind of thing, and more into slightly more ornamental hedges. So the Fatinia red robin, for instance. So you've got the flower and then you've got the red shoots as well. So um, but but it'll, you know, it, hydrangeas, everyone used to hate them 10, 15 years ago. We'd never put hydrangea in a garden. Now I'm putting hydrangeas in pretty much every garden I do because 
it's usually on someone's wish list during the design consultation <laughs> and they said you know and their friends have got them so they want them and it's all that kind of thing really it's quite interesting now on to the next question i know that there's a strong apple culture in the uk and it's still somewhat popular to grow apple trees in the backyard sure yeah so uh what are the most popular apple trees to grow in the backyard if you know that um so the with apple trees we don't put that many in although we do some we put probably more of the little the the, the again the pleached ones the espaliers that go so they don't take too much space a lot of gardens around Surrey, where I work mostly, um, they've often got some old apple trees still in the garden from you know, back in the 1930s when everyone used to grow a lot more vegetables and apples because they weren't so readily available at supermarkets. And, and it was a different culture post post war and everyone's a bit more self-sufficient. So people love to preserve the apple trees they've got there. If they've got an apple tree in the garden, they generally want, they're like, we want to try and keep this apple tree. You know, it doesn't, if, if we can fix that into the design somehow, then that would be great. There's, um, and then there's some people, more people are moving towards growing again now, especially with the last 18 months with lockdown and everything. And I think people, you know, people have just got much more into outdoor space and, playing around with plants really they've, they've they're now appreciating nature a lot more which is great um so so we are putting vegetable patches and like kitchen gardens people like that, where they're a bit more designed into like parterres and things um and and they will often want an apple tree or, or two but not that many and it's usually i'd say it's usually the traditional varieties um cox cox's orange pippin or or golden delicious Brayburn is it's the fairly obvious ones that that you will see in a supermarket I guess because they're thinking well let's grow some of our own and then we don't need to buy so many and, and they're easy to grow aren't they really so as long as you don't get mildew and mealy bug is the main problem on apple trees and mildew really so um a little bit of an apple tree renaissance but it's not not quite back to the old days yet i don't think not sure it will be thank you and uh on to the next question what is your primary primary inspiration in the design of your landscapes i mean what's your biggest influence in terms of uh your landscape designs um quite a hard question because i don't I, the way I approach design, I, I'm very much client led. So I will spend some time and I have a procedure I go through, which works very well, actually, um, where I eke out information from the client, uh, their criteria there, like you would with a house build, you know, so we go through a, a, a process and, and Pinterest boards and things like that. Um, so it gives me the ingredients for creating the garden in a cake basically so i but but the ingredients come from the client so it doesn't leave by the time i've collated all that together and then and then what i do then is put it all together in the right way so it works with the the the, the soil the sun the, the style of the house and etc and, and all their their living styles and and their tastes it's um by the time i've done that there's not much room for influence from, from it's not like i then look at like a gertrude jekyll garden and go i'm going to put some of that in there because i think that'll look good because it may not be appropriate um but i guess my personal favorite style of gardens would be the, the much more the, the the more modern style and more formal gardens i like um but i also like a very sort of jungly look so i suppose I probably don't take influence from people and designers so much as places I've been and gardens I've been to places, um, you know, Heligan and, and gardens in, in Cornwall. There's some lovely 
god you can go visit in there and they're quite tropical with lots of tree ferns and and that kind of look which i personally love and in my garden i've got that look going on ferns tree ferns aces and um quite sort of jungly looking um and then i also like the f sort of french formality with the symmetry a lot of straight lines quite quite rigid so two completely different styles really um and I, so i guess i do with the planting i'll, I'll if someone's going that way I'll, i i will push towards the if they want a formal garden i'll go formal and, and generally with some modern twist and keep it quite a small planting palette that's I, I, that i like um but my yeah so my influences would be places i visited i used to spend a lot of time at kew gardens when i was a kid just in the glass houses used to love it done i've traveled a fair bit and I, I love visiting jungles and wild landscapes so um i'd probably be more i like bringing some of that into people's gardens where i can so um i guess it, yeah it's places places i've visited and certain plants that i i like that i use as influence rather than certain designers or specific methods if you like uh, what are your favorite plants to use in landscapes my favorite plants um i i i love olives and actually that's another one that's very popular so um statement piece olive trees you know the big gnarly ones um which look amazing um tree ferns love tree ferns coolness the like the um cornus cusa um the with the great big fat flower on it that's quite i i guess the sort of more out there ones the, the, the more the quite statement piece plants i really like um and i'm also a fan of japanese maples as well aces so but then i i'm also really in the last few years i've got much more into perennials and herbaceous plants never used to have much time for them if i'm honest it they weren't that popular and it used to be all about shrubs and trees and things but now i'm 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 developing a keen interest in in the perennials so especially the more loose natural looking stuff like the nepetas and, and you know and, and also some of the taller grasses miscanthus i like they're a great great plant to use quite structurally can screen areas off without being too obtrusive so um yeah but, but more architectural stuff though but yeah with my favorite top favorite plant is a tree fern the, that, that's got to be the um they're just magnificent things planted in groups that look great excellent so in terms of uh native uh uk for what's your do you use that in your garden design often? No, not much, to be honest. It's, um, there's, no, interestingly. <laughs> Actually, it's not, most people have got some native trees already in their garden. Um, very rarely get asked to plant native trees. People usually want something a bit different and more interesting. Uh, and then the smaller i'm trying to think of what native plants there are in the uk and it's pretty limited i mean most of the stuff we've got that you'll see in gardens has been brought in from overseas at some point um probably 95 percent of the plants so I'd, it's very minimal use of native plants um just because people don't really they don't ask for that but then the area i work in the gardens are not we're not working with acreage we're working you know they're generally well some of them are a couple of acres or so but they're they're not big country estates where i think you'd see a lot more of that people creating their own arboretums and things that's more out into the bit further in the countryside for me the cotswolds that that sort of area you'd probably need to go for that so um no, it's not. It's not a thing, really. That's good. Well, I think that covers the interview, I think.
So uh, do you have any last uh, thoughts to give to the audience? Well, I think it, yeah, to go back to the comment I made earlier about the, the way people are looking at their gardens and plants, I think, um, I don't know, I mean, where I forget where you guys are based, you're obviously... I'm in Canada. Right, okay. So I don't, I'm presuming you're the same things going on over there with, um, I don't know what your lockdown situation is either, I get bored looking now at these things, but um, are you still, are you heavy? heavy? Although yeah, I know. we're moving out and then we're moving back in, sort of thing. Right, because it's all gone a bit Nazi, hasn't it? Around lots of places, which is not good. But um, the the result, certainly in the UK, from um, where we seem to be having it a little bit easier now, um, of of the whole lockdown, you know, and a positive from it, because we need to try and look at positives. I think at the moment um, is this connection with nature that and people just slowing down taking a step back and going actually yeah i quite like sitting outside in my garden i'll do some work out there you know it's um it, much more working from home less traveling people have got more time they're over here people have got absolutely like reinvigorated it well invigorated because they probably weren't invigorated in the first place people that you had no interest in the outdoors around them uh, are out there doing bits and pieces in the garden we, we're seeing we've seen a huge influx of work in the last year from it as everyone in the industry um and it's I, I just think it's a really obviously from a work point of view it's a positive thing but also from from a, a psychological point of view it, it's great to see people appreciating the plants for because they really do if you know you try and imagine a space outdoors with no plants it's pretty grim it, 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 I, I just think you can't put too much importance on on the power of plants and around you the, you know the, the joy the relaxation and just the enjoyment they give people yeah i will admit that the lockdown did push me to do a lot more stuff than i than i was always putting off so that's always a good thing as well yeah yeah, you gotta you gotta make the best of it, don't you? Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you uh, sit around doing nothing, I guess. Yeah, get miserable. So, Life gives you lemons, make lemonade, I guess. So, uh, you're sorry. Give... Life gives you lemons, make lemonade, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Quite. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that covers everything. So I'll end the recording and thank you for coming by. I as a guest on my on my uh, podcast. No problems, pleasure.